Good morning. Is this thing working? No, it's not working. It's on. Hello? Am I loud enough? <laughs> okay. Um, I've got some pictures um, that I think they've got up there that we'll just kind of just scroll through those as I talk. But, um, but Chad asked me to just kind of give a, a missions report on the Mexico uh, mission trip that I went on a couple weeks ago. Um, this, this trip, well, first I want to thank you all um, that were praying for us and, and our team as we were down there. Uh, we didn't have any sicknesses. We didn't have any breakdowns. We did have a a battery um, on our van that went out, but that wasn't a big deal. We, it was right at the border where we had trouble with it, and so as soon as we came across back into the United States, we found a Walmart, bought a brand new battery, and, and we were back on the road again. But uh, this trip was a little bit different than uh, some of the other uh, mission trips to Mexico that I have been on. Um, one, my family wasn't with me, so that was a big difference. Uh, uh, normally, they would go with me, my daughter and my wife, but uh, this time it was me and seven other uh, people, uh, seven other people and I, um, and the, from the uh, churches that are south of us. Uh, um, we, uh, we, we did what we normally do, drive down uh, close to the border, stay at a hotel at the border so we're not crossing over um, when it's dark because uh, those first 20 miles into Mexico can be pretty rough at times. Um, so then we'd wake up the next morning, drive across, and on Sunday we would try to attend a church in Monterey, um, this church that we would uh, attend there um, is kind of a hub for a lot of churches um, sending out pastors to these outer areas around Monterey, and uh, they would train up pastors, send them out to areas that don't have churches, and, and these guys would start, these pastors would start churches. Um, but we went to this church, and, and they kind of surprised us. Uh, Dexter, I don't know, in one of the slides you might see an, an older gentleman pushing a wheelbarrow, uh, that's Dexter. For uh, about 38 years, uh, Dexter has been going to Mexico uh, two times a year, and uh, he's, he's um, put it out there that he's retiring from it. He, his health's not um, up to what it used to be, so he's happened to step back from the role of leading these mission trips, and so he's been asking for people to just start praying about that, so you as a church might pray about that um, for Lee and I. Uh, we're kind of looking into uh, if God leads, because I don't want to step out into something that uh, God's not wanting me in. I've got enough on my plate as it is, um, but just be praying for us. Uh, December 3rd, we're going to go and uh, meet up with another couple in Antlers um, that ha they've gone with us several times, and they're also praying, and their church is praying that to see if God's leading them into maybe partnering uh, with us to, to keep this mission going. But um, we, 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 they had a farewell party for Dexter, and then we took off driving, so this was new, because normally we would just sleep on the floor of this church that we attend on the, on the Sunday there. We would just sleep there. But we took off driving and drove about another two hours south uh, to a little area. I don't even know if you could call it a town um, called Tanguma. Um, it, what I saw there was a dirt road, and there were houses on each side of the road, probably about 20 houses, and that was what was called Tanguma. And so there's an orphanage there that we stayed at, and I'd, I'd heard of this place, but I had not been there, so they have done other mission trips in that area. Um, but this was my first time to go to this place. There were no kids at this orphanage. Um, the government shut them down. Uh, they found out that they were teaching the kids about Christ, and uh, they told them to stop doing it, and they said, no, this is, this is the reason we have this orphanage, is to um, physically uh, provide needs for these children, but also spiritually, so um, the government shut them down. So this, this building was kind of a nice place to stay. They had bunk beds, and they had the guy's side, girl's side. Girls had hot water. We didn't. Um, I was looking forward, though, after a hard day's worth of work, um, come back, and they were on a well, so it was really, really cold water. And I would just get, it was rough at first, but you got used to it, and it would just kind of knock that day off of, of the heat, so it was pretty nice. Uh, we, would, we would stay there at night, wake up the next morning, eat a pretty good breakfast that Dexter, he's, he's really good about breakfast. He would have, fix a big old meal for all of us. And then we, this, this trip was also different because in the past we would go work on these little churches that are all around Monterey um, that they would just need different things, help on um, financially and uh, physically need some help on these buildings to repair them. Um, so the next morning we, we woke up and we ate, left about a two hour drive to another spot that I'd never been to. There was a church there that originally when this got donated, it got donated from a Seventh-day Adventist church that um, 
just they just nobody was showing up there and in Mexico if if a building sits vacant for very long the government takes control of it that it becomes theirs so when the timeline was about to run out uh, this this pastor of a Baptist church nearby uh, which I think is about two hours away from his his home church he found out about this building and asked if they would donate it so they did and it was just a just a square uh, concrete building with a metal roof over it no no electricity no plumbing um, several tr different trips that have happened in the past um, uh, crews have gone from the states there and they uh, plumbed in a bathroom for this building they put a new roof on this building a concrete roof um, they uh, ran electricity and while we were there we were painting and stuccoing where all these repairs were done and then there was a I don't know if you've seen one of the slides, there's, there's a ditch where we're digging alongside the building. A bunch of dirt was up against the building, and the building would sweat from this dirt. So we had to go through there and, and basically little, be little backhoes, and uh, that one right there. And we would throw all that dirt up on the hill, and then there was somebody on the hill that had to throw it even further because we were running out of room. But while we were working on this church, here's, here's something that was really good. So I was thinking, oh, it's just a work week. Well, I mean, like I, I come here because I want to share Jesus with with um, people and so that's what the VBS's would do we would work all day long and then the ladies would prepare all the supplies for like the vacation Bible schools in the evening and then we would go out and do those but this trip there were no vacation Bible schools but we no I noticed there was a guy that was walking around while we were all working and he's dressed really nice and he's just watching and uh, we we had some confusion right there when we were digging one day we had dug a whole bunch of it up and then we show up the next day and they're telling us to fill in some of it and so we started kind of going, well, why is this? And they said, well, the architect, he's here, and he's saying that we, we messed up on something. So, so he's like, well, let's bring him around here. Let's just start talking to him. And we had a guy that's kind of a gruff guy that was in our group, and, and he, just, he just said oh, to our interpreter, he's like, well, does he know Jesus? And uh, the interpreter's like, well, do you want me to ask him? And he's like, yeah, I asked him. So the interpreter asked him, and the guy said, yeah, I know Jesus. And then this guy said, well, no, let me rephrase that. Does he have a relationship with Jesus? Because he was kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't even say he was being mean or anything, but he was kind of being harsh, like, let's do this. Well, he's the architect. we got to listen to what he's wanting to do. And uh, he said, no, I, I don't have a relationship with Christ. And so um, we just kind of started talking, and God opened an opportunity to where I was able to just kind of walk through the gospel. And it was, it was kind of messed up because I'd not done that much through an interpreter, so that kind of threw me off a little bit. But, but he, got, he got the gist of it, that he's a sinner, need of a Savior, and that's what Christ did on that cross, was paid away. And, and we asked him, would you, would you, have you ever made a decision to follow Christ? And he said, no, I, I have not ever made that decision. And we asked him if he would like to, and he said yes. So we were able to surround him, pray for him. Uh, we gave him a Bible after we was done and got to talking to him about, hey, this is just the start of it, um, like, and asked him if he had a family, and he said he had two daughters and a wife, and, and we was like, man, now, now you're responsible for them. Like, like get plugged in somewhere. And, and so he had traveled, so he probably wouldn't be going to that church. Uh, I was hoping, like, when we got back, like I, uh, that Sunday after, I would, one of those local people would send me a picture of Omar, so be praying for Omar that God continues that work in his life because all we can do is throw seeds, right, and water. God's the one that does the growth. So, uh, so pray that God will do this growth in Omar. But I was hoping to see a picture of him and his family sitting in church, but I haven't seen that. But, but that's in God's hands. I mean, um, and that's kind of what all we did this trip. I mean, but I, I did want to point out, like, uh, there, you might have seen some people handing out food and stuff like that. That's, that's some of the things that Dexter when he goes down there, he helps support financially, uh, and churches around here help support financially for these groups of people that will go out to these areas, because these areas don't have a lot of churches. I mean, they got a lot of Catholic churches, um, but, the, but they don't have a lot of church, evangelical churches out there, and so these pastors, they have their home church, and then they find these other churches where there's no people, no churches gathering, and, and they'll preach on Sunday morning, and some of these pastors will drive two, three, four, five, six hours away from the church to go to these other little churches and just try to draw some people in there and preach another message to them. And some of these pastors do it like five or six times on Sunday at different locations all over the place. And the roads are rough. I mean, it, I, I, I almost can... I just want to go out at night, look for whoever's doing this, but I got to drive the whole time we was down there because Dexter thinks that God's 100% handing this off to me. So he was pointing pastors and stuff to me, and I, so I got to meet a lot of pastors, and they were, they were talking to me, telling me their needs and stuff, but um, he, he had me drive in Mexico 
Well, Mexico, there's speed bumps everywhere, and, and they move. Like, I, I, it's, I just, I could almost, like, go out there at night and see somebody making these things, but um, you'd just be driving down a road, and there wasn't one there the day before, and so everybody in the back of your van you're responsible for is a driver, and um, a few of them hit their heads on the ceilings a couple times while I was driving, but um, that, that's, it, so that all that to say, these roads that these pastors are driving on, on Sundays and stuff, sometimes it can take them just to get a few miles. It can take them an hour just because of how messed up the roads are around there. So, um, and, and Dexter, he, he's passing all this off to whoever God puts in, in this place. But um, th- th- some of these families, they'll, they'll load up a, a trailer, uh, the one that, we was talk- that I got to talk to that we stayed at the orphanage, that they were the ones in control of that. Um, they load up once a, once, one week every month. They load up a, a trailer full of food, tracks, Bibles, guitar, um, and their family, and they just go travel for a week. And they'll just travel from area to area, just pull up on a street where there's no churches anywhere near there, and they'll just start pulling out all their food tables and stuff, and, and they just draw a big crowd. And they'll feed people, and then, they'll, then they um, will teach them the gospel. They'll share the gospel with them. So it's a really good work. And one of those pastors told me, he said, um, without the United States support for them, just them, they, they, they raise their own monies too so they can keep the mission going. But it would, it would hinder them from about reaching about 200 people. Like that's a, 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 a once, um, a one week out of every month, 200 people they would not be able to reach if it wasn't for the funds of the United States. So, I mean, so be praying that God will put whoever that is in that place. And um, that's pretty much all. I mean, there's some of the stuff they do on the street. They just pull up. And hand out stuff. They draw, I've, and they every day I'm seeing pictures because this is like a couple of different groups that do this. But I, I'm friends with them now on Facebook, and I, I get all these pictures of where they're just kids just lined up in a row, and the, and this adult is sitting on the ground with them and just sharing uh, the good news of the gospel with them. So, so just be in prayer for the missions in Mexico. That's all I've got for that. So now I've got the awesome privilege of um, being able to bring this morning's sermon. Um, I think it's a pretty good one. Uh, it's kind of interesting how God led me to where I'm going to be at this morning, and it's going to be in Luke chapter 1. And I kind of failed. Uh, I didn't get verses up on the screen. Um, I, I, it was kind of a misunderstanding there, uh, my fault. But uh, So you're going to have to use your Bibles. So, And if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the pew in front of you. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. And, and I'm not a polished preacher, you all know that. Uh, I get real nervous getting up here and stuff, and, and, and I get nervous trying to prepare for this, and I'm just pleading with God, like, help it to make any sense at all, because, I mean, because <laughs> he's the one that does that, but um, I, in trying to figure out a, head, a title for this sermon, it was pretty easy, because the heading above the scriptures we're going to read is the title that I put, so it is the birth of John the Baptist foretold, and I just want to tell you, I mean, how I'm going to do this, too, is just basically I'm just going to read, and, and I'm just going to kind of break this down, and, and, and I know in my head there's like skeptics going off and going like, well, some people are going to go, I could have done that at my house. I could have just taken Scripture and just walked through Scripture at my house. I've never done it like this, though, at my house. Like, I'll read, but when it came to this, I found through searching and studying, I found all kinds of neat things that God just kept popping out at me. And I'm a nugget guy, like a gold nugget, when I'm hearing a sermon. I mean, I may not remember points and all those things of a sermon, but I remember, like, little things that happen throughout the sermon. And I'm hoping that's what God does for you all through this. But I've just, I'm just going to walk through and read, and I'm just going to kind of point to other scriptures and kind of draw out of these scriptures something that I hope, and this is my hope, prayer, um, that we would all just draw closer to God, that we would see his word more clearly and, and understand it a little bit better. And, and just and basically I heard a pastor say one time that look at this, this the Bible as a window. I love that. I love that. It's a window into heaven. It's a window into what God is doing, what, what he said, what he's done, what he's going to do, what he says about us, what he says he's done for us. So it's just a window to, and that's what I hope this morning is we just get a glimpse, a clearer vision. And, and I like to point back a couple weeks ago to a message that Pastor Chad preached on uh, Mark 8, 22 through 26. Um, and if you want to look it up, if you missed it, it's, it was November 6th, 
and you can find it on our uh, Facebook page. But uh, the message was over Jesus um, healing a blind man. And, and there was a gold nugget in that. Like, it was, it was one of the best, I mean, and I, it, it really was one of the best sermons I, have, I can remember hearing because of this, this major thing that God used to open my eyes to something that's been a blinder in my life. And we all kind of know this, but we need reminded constantly. But um, it, Chad uh, broke down those scriptures, and, and it, Jesus takes this blind man by the hand. He leads him out of the city. He spits in the guy's eyes. And then he asked him, can you see anything? And the blind man says, I, I see, I see men walking around like trees. He was seeing just very blurry. It was very fuzzy. And then Chad took that opportunity to go, is, is, is that how we see scripture? Is that how we see God? Is that how we see something so beautiful as the words that are in this book and so beautiful as the one who created us and all that he has done? Do we see him dimly? Do we see him um, f uh, in a fuzzy light? And, 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 and that's, that's my hope and prayer for this sermon is that God would use something in this sermon to clear up our vision of who he is so that, and the purpose is, so that we may glorify him. That's what all of creation is. That's why he created everything, is to bring honor and glory to him. And we as Christians especially want to bring honor and glory to him, just like in 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For we were bought with a price. If you're a follower of Jesus in here, you were bought with a price. And that was Jesus' blood on the cross. And it says, and then the end of that verse says, So glorify God in your body glorify God. That's what we want to do. We want to glorify God, so that's my hope for you all. So I've given you the title, uh, The Birth of John the Baptist uh, Foretold. I've given you the scriptures. We'll be in Luke chapter 1, and, and then I've given you the reason. And then a funny little story, um, trying to come up with points. I already told you I'm not very good at that, so Wednesday after uh, youth uh, I was struggling with that, and I, I pulled Chad to the, Pastor Chad to the side, and I said, hey, would it be okay if on Sunday I didn't really have any uh, points for the sermon? And he real quickly just looked at me and said, yeah, I guess you could preach a pointless sermon. And so, yeah, yeah, I walked, I, I walked right into that one. I walked right into that one. So, in hopes of not preaching a pointless sermon today, I came up with a few points. So, and they're going to come, they're going to come really quick. So I know I've taken a long time with the missions, and, um, but these two points are going to come really quick just in like one verse. They're both going to pop out. But my first point is God keeps his promise. God keeps his promise. And then my second point will be the Holy Spirit imparts power for ministry. And so I, I was going to have some words on the screen and we were going to stand, but, uh, but I'm just going to just take off reading for the sake of time. I'm going to watch that out of respect for the kids' hall and everything, but I'm just, I'm just going to walk through this. So just, just try to listen. I mean, I think we'll go deeper than we, most people normally would of just reading scriptures. So see if something God uses to just open your eyes and, and help you to see a little bit clear, more clearly what God is saying to us. But let me pray first, and then I'll get into it. So, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, just be on mission for you. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that, that you have supplied us for ministry, each and every one of us. We all um, have a ministry that you have given us. Uh, Lord, just help us to find what that is, to see clearly uh, what you would have us to do in this world to further the kingdom, to share the gospel among the nations, to draw our hearts to you, to love you more than anything else, to see you as something so precious that nothing else can compare. And then, Lord, I, I was listening to a sermon this week, and a, a pastor said that one of his prayers that he likes to pray before he preaches, um, I, I, I loved it. And I, and I want to pray that now, Lord, that, that you would send your spirit, send your spirit now, Lord, to preach a better message than I have prepared. Let it be glorifying to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're going to start, uh, I'm just going to start right there in verse 1, because I want, I want to kind of just let us see, and I'll stop about 25 but I, I want us to see just kind of how Luke, um, Luke is, is a doctor, and he has taken this, um, this book here, and he's, 
He's went out, and he's not an eyewitness. I, and I've learned so much here. Like, things I knew, Darren even got on to me. Um, he did a whole um, uh, play, a little, or uh, uh, drama over Luke and stuff, and, and it described a bunch of these things. But I lost that. Like, I constantly need reminded about things. I, I almost was to the point, this is why I don't think I'm one that is, should be up here. Um, I, almost, I think I thought Luke was, in a, uh, he was, a, he was one of the disciples, but he was not. He was not one of the disciples. And so through studying this all out and stuff, I was like, what? Um, I, I just thought with the name changes, you know, like how some of the disciples, they come to know Christ and then they change their name. And I just kind of thought that maybe he was one of those guys that got his name changed. But Luke was not an eyewitness of a lot of the things that he's writing about. But Luke was a very smart man. He was a doctor. He went out and he got all the eyewitness accounts. He interviewed people. And then this is how he came up with the book of Luke. Uh, it was, he was wanting to write his own account. And we see that in, first, in the first few verses here. So I'll just start reading. Uh, Luke 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And this is one of my my purposes, my hopes for all of us, that we will have a certainty of the things that have been taught. Um, so we see Luke is writing to a man that he calls most excellent Theopolis. I tried to figure out who that guy was. There's so many different views on him. Some even thought maybe that his name means something like those who love God. So it could have been for all Christians, which we do know this book is for all of us. But Theopolis, one thing I will say, I'm 100% sure that him and Luke were pretty good friends. So I walked away going, they're pretty good friends. I did see that even in Luke's name and some of his past that he was possibly a slave at one time, and this might have been his slave master. And, but he is free here, and so you can see how they bonded somehow that where he set out to write this account so that he would know um, for certain uh, these things that he has been taught. And so that's how the book of Luke, and then we see there's a sequel to this book, Acts, and that starts out too, um, where he's writing that to Theopolis. Some think that Theopolis might have uh, funded um, his research and stuff. So moving on to verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we see in these few verses that there's a king in Judea. His name is Herod. And we see that there's a priest, and his name is Zechariah. Um, Zechariah is of the division of Abijah, so a division would have been a group of priests. Uh, I heard some preachers say that there was 20,000 priests at this time, and they would break them up. Some said 18,000, but they would break them up in these groups, and they would call them in to do the temple work. And so they would call a group, and it just so happens the group that Zechariah is a part of is the, uh, is the group called Abijah. We see that Zechariah is married, um, and she is a descendant of Aaron, um, Moses' brother, and her name is Elizabeth. And verse 6, we see, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So that doesn't mean they were without sin. Uh, we know that Scripture says, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So they have sin in their life, but they are people who are, what it looks like, are seeking God. They are following God. Verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So we see Zechariah and Elizabeth, neither one of them had children. Elizabeth can't even have, she can't even get pregnant, she's barren. And on top of that, they're both older. They're old, they're advanced in years. Verse 8, now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the customs of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And if you're not following along, you might think that he was chosen by a guy named Lot, but uh, it's, it's the lowercase l. This lot is 
um, like a dice, or um, some would say it was by chance. But we as Christians can't say by chance because of what Scripture says. Um, it, we know in the Old Testament we see things of, of the lot that's cast in the lap, every outcome, every where it falls. So like dice, every time you roll dice, every outcome of that dice is determined by God. So there is no chance. So this right here was like a lot, like a dice that was thrown to, to find out which priest was going to do this. And all the priests wanted to be this person that went in and lit incense. It was like the pinnacle of this, of this uh, ceremony. Um, it was, in, and not all would ever be able to do that. It's a once-in-a-lifetime deal, almost like a lottery, like if you got this. Um, but, and some believe that maybe the way this lot thing happened was there was like these papers uh, that were rolled up and these priests had walked through and they would just grab one and whatever th it, the duty on there for them to do that that's what they would do but i th i think this is really cool so if you think about that verse of um every roll of the dice it's what it falls on is determined by god um we see here that zachariah is chosen he is chosen by god to go in for the burnt in to do the burnt incense uh and then we'll move on to verse 10 here it says and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense that's important we'll see another verse over here in a minute talking about the people outside but there's this whole group of people outside and they're all praying at this hour of incense and there appeared to him so Zechariah, while he was in there at the altar burning the incense there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So to kind of give you a little bit of a layout of the temple, um, temple was made up of two main rooms. You had your uh, first room, uh, the holy place, and then past the, the veil was the holy of holies. Well, in the holy place, you would have a lampstand to your left, straight ahead in the center closest to the veil, uh, would have been the uh, altar of incense. This is where he's at. And then over to your right, there was a table for the the showbread, the bread of presence over here. Um, and, and so he's at this altar, and then next to it, to the right of it, an angel appears to him. And, and this, if you know much about, this is things that I kind of learned as I was studying this out, if you know much about where we're at in the timeline of the church of God's people, this is the first thing that has happened in 400 years from God. They call it the 400 years of silence. So before this, before this angel appeared, there were no prophecies, no prophets, no miracles that we know of, no angels for 400 years. So here's a priest. Think about that. A priest for, priest for 400 years doing these ceremonies with no word from God. And then all of a sudden, Zechariah is chosen by God. He's in the temple, and an angel appears to him. You can only imagine how he was feeling, and verse 12 tells us. And Zechariah was ter uh, uh, troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. When I first read that, I was thinking maybe he was praying for a baby, because the angel says your prayer has been heard, but then, I mean, and, and if I would have just gone through here just reading like normal, then I would have just moved on thinking that. But I, the more I got to looking at this, for one, he's in there lighting the incense. The incense, the smoke coming up from that, was, is, it was a representation of prayers going up to God. So the people were outside praying, and he's in there uh, lighting this for the sake of the people, like for their prayers. And, and so then the other thing, too, is here in a little bit, we see um, where he starts arguing kind of a little bit with the angel and going like, how can this be that my wife can have a baby? So why would he have been praying that and then immediately after going, like, this can't be true. So I think he was older in his time to where he had passed those, the, the days of hoping to have a child and, and he was probably praying for something for the people of God, which is significant because what's happening here is John the Baptist is ushered in um, uh, for the preparation of God's people. Um, but no doubt, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth would have been praying for a child in their younger days. So maybe it was an answer of that prayer from way back, but we'll keep going. Um, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, 
and you shall call his name John. Verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. That's crazy. Like a, he, a baby is filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Like, I don't know of anywhere else in all of Scripture where we get that a baby being filled with the, with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, other than there is some stuff about King David. Um, but anywhere else, I don't know of anything else for this. So that's, that's amazing. This is an amazing anoint, anointing that's put on uh, John. Verse 16, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah, being a priest, that should have blown his mind. I'm going to turn back 400 years in my Bible to the last book of the Old Testament, the last prophet of the Old Testament, uh, Malachi, and the last chapter of that book, and the last verses of that book. So these are the last two verses of our Old Testament, and this is my first point, God keeps his promise. So remember, I'm going to have back-to-back points right here, um, but God keeps his promise. So way back 400 years ago, I'm going to start reading in Malachi chapter 4, 5 through 6, it says, Behold, so this, is, this is God speaking through the prophet of Malachi, saying, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. What great and awesome day is that? Anybody? Jesus. Jesus. So so this is kind of fitting for the holiday, right? I mean, this is John the Baptist. We've got one holiday and then the birth of Jesus we celebrate for Christmas. So he's saying, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. That last part was a little weird about he'd be, lest he come and strike the people down. God's people for 400 years of silence from God had been losing their way. They were, they were worshiping other gods. They had other temples built to, God, to these other gods. And, and so God is making a promise that, hey, I will send someone, Elijah, to straighten this out, to turn the hearts of fathers. And we, and we just read that. This is just like verse 16. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So right there, the, this part about the fathers and the children, I, I, I kind of dug into that. There's some thoughts on that. Um, what I walked away with is uh, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. You see God go from the family, you see the family go. You see, and, and the way to think of it is if, if a family is not seeking after God, then they're seeking after just vapor things. The Bible says they're seeking after earthly things that will go away. And so that, let that speak to all of us in here that have children or grandchildren. Um, to, that, we, that is our job to pour the eternal into them, to train them up in a way that they see God as, as great and mighty because this world is fading away. So it's, it's a way of turning the hearts of the fathers back to their children to teach them about the one true God. So let that, let that be something for all of us. That, we, that is our jobs as adults to, to turn around and teach the next generation because what else are they going to have? Something that's just vapor that's going to go away. These are eternal matters. And then my next point, the Holy Spirit imparts power for ministry. We see that John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He has this Holy Spirit and he does these things in the spirit and power of Elijah For what purpose? We see it at the end of verse uh, 17. It says, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And and I'm going to flip real quick to Luke's other book that he wrote, Acts 
chapter 1. I'm just going to be there for one verse. You don't have to go there unless you want to. But Acts 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, so this is Jesus. He's leaving his disciples, and he's telling them, I'm going to send the helper. And he says to them, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So what for, Jesus? What for? Why are you sending us um, your spirit um, in, in, in power? And he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I would just ask us all, including myself, have we received the Holy Spirit? If you're a follower of Christ, yes, you have the Holy Spirit. And for what purpose? Like, what is, what is the purpose? What is, there's lots of different things the Holy Spirit does, but He imparts power for ministry. We should be, as John is here, He is to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Are you prepared? Are you being readied for the day of the Lord's return? Are you going outward and doing that for others? Are you preparing a people for the day of the Lord? We'll move on to verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, this, what, this is what makes me think about the prayer um, that he probably wasn't praying in the temple at that moment for a baby. Um, he, he says to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, um, I am Gabriel. We should all... that name of that angel that tells us there's 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 some importance there gabriel we've heard that before he says i stand in the presence of god gabriel stands in the presence of god and he says i was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news verse 20 and behold you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. Remember the people in verse 10? The whole multitude was outside and they were praying at the time of the hour of incense. Um, well, evidently right here we see in verse 21, they have stopped praying because it says, and the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. Um, some say that the priest would come out from lighting the incense and he would bring a blessing for the people. Well, they're starting to worry about him. He's been in there a while, so they're, they're wondering at his delay in the temple. Verse 22, And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. Uh, if the worship team would come on up, I'm finishing up here. I'm just going to read to verse 25. Um, it says, uh, verse 20. Two, towards the end there it says, And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when the time of the service had ended, he went to his home. After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived. His wife who was barren, old in age, um, she, she is pregnant. And the Bible says in verse 24, And for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. I, I can't help but think like she stayed hidden for five months because she almost wanted to do a ta-da moment. Like she was probably showing at five months and these people had put this reproach upon her because back then you would see if you weren't able to have kids, people would almost like hold that against you and say, you must have done something bad. God must be mad at you because, because you can't have children. And, and so she hides herself for five months. Maybe, I, don't, I have no idea why she did it, but I, I want to just think that maybe she was showing pretty good and she just popped out and was like, in your faces kind of deal. Um, but she, she stayed hidden, but then she gave glory to God. I love that. She says, thus the Lord has done for me in, this, in the day when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. And then that should rem remind us all of another baby that came and took away the reproach of us, not, of, not between us and people, but between us and a just and holy God. So let me pray, and then we'll sing a song, and then Chad will dismiss us. So. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I, I just continue this prayer of, of just saying, Lord, draw us unto you. Help us to see your word is precious. Help us to share this. Give us, give us power for the ministry that you have for each one of us. 
Open our eyes to see clearly what it is that you would have each one of us do. Help us not to waste this life uh, on earthly things. Help us to just spend our lives in a way that is for eternal uses. Lord, I just pray that you come, Lord Jesus, our fountain of every blessing. Turn our hearts to sing of thy grace. Father, pour out your streams of mercy that never cease. Give us, O Lord, songs of loudest praise. In Jesus' name, amen.